Coffee with H Times 2. Today on our show, I'll be speaking with Lucas Folia, a photographer who photographs people in nature and uses that to tell stories about people and also about nature. So Lucas, you grew up in Long Island on a farm. Yeah, my parents have a farm about 30 miles from New York City. My grandparents bought the land in the 1960s. My parents built a house next door. And as I was growing up, the suburbs developed around us. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we are one of the last farms left in the area. And, and what did you grow there? What, what do you grow there? It's a 100-person community share agriculture, CSA. So they grow organically. People come every week to pick up food. And the people who are involved in the project throughout the community get to see what it's like to know where their food comes from, mm -hmm. to know the farmers who grow it, and to partake in that process. And people come and volunteer there and, and, and participate in the, yeah. in the growing of the food too. And actually one of the, like I meet people for a living. And I go into areas where, that I think there's a story that's important for the world to see. Mm. And I interact with a very wide range of people. And I think I learned that growing up on a farm because it being one of the only farms left in town, people came to visit often and all different types of people came to visit. So from the age of three, I was walking around talking to strangers and now I talk to strangers for a living and get to be friends by photographing them. That's fascinating. So I've been to your farm, your parents' farm, your farm. It's just so beautiful. It's my parents' farm. It's your parents' farm. I live in San Francisco. Okay, so but. you live in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So let's learn a little bit more about your journey. So that, that, so that farm is magical, I just want to say. Well, so the other, a few seasons ago, my father was picking zucchini. And I was with him, I was visiting. Mm -hmm. And I think I was on my way to Japan or Germany or somewhere for a photo shoot or an exhibition. And my dad bowed with a zucchini in his hand. And I said, what's up, you know? And he said, well, you get attention and sometimes applause for talking about what I do. Sometimes I want some applause for doing it. Oh. You know, and it's a strange thing in this world that there's enough media attention around food mm -hmm. and around environment today. But the people who are growing the food are often overlooked. And so I think my dad deserves applause too. Oh, I agree. And I think I'll yeah. interview your dad. I, Great. I highly respect He looks your better. He's got the afro and the beard. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so. your dad's fabulous. I, I love talking to your dad and asking him questions. Mm -hmm. So you grew up on the farm, and then you went to school in Long Island, high school here. And, and mm -hmm. what got you into photography? And when did you start taking photographs? When I was in high school, I never quite fit in. All right, we were a liberal, activist, farm family in suburban Long Island. And one summer, my mother said, why don't you take your dad's camera and go photograph on the farm. And I just started taking pictures and then went to visit my aunt, Gina, in Provincetown and realized that I could go and talk to anybody if I had a camera in my hand. And then coming home, and my parents helped me print the pictures for the first time. And I'm, I was young, and so I didn't... Uh, so you used a dark room? I like drove me to the photo lab oh, for wow. the first rolls of film and then I brought those pictures to high school and, and showed them to the art teacher and he let me use the darkroom after hours. I taught myself and learned from different classes. When I was 18, I met a photographer named Arnold Newman in New York City, who's a quite well-known portrait photographer. And he became a mentor and let me print at his darkroom. So on summers, the first few summers at, uh, of college, I left Brown University and went down to New York and would make photographs and print them there and met an art community and an art world through that experience. And didn't you in your high school do some project in Maine at a photography program? So I or? met Arnold Newman at the Maine Photographic Workshops, okay. which is now Maine Media Workshops, where I might actually go back teaching soon. So, really? Yeah, kind of. Really? It's fun how it goes full circle. So you went up there yeah. one summer, didn't you? You went on a bus by yourself to Maine? Yeah. And I think I, they might have driven me up, I can't remember. But the pr when I was in Maine, that was the first time where I was, in a sense, on my own. You know, and, and what I had as a reason to be there was just the photographs. And how old were you then? I was 18. And then the portraits that I made there with a Hasselblad from the 1970s uh, ended up being, I, I showed those portraits to Arnold Newman he became a mentor. 
I then went into college having a mentor in New York, took classes at RISD, and it became my identity. When I was in college, I photographed at a community garden where refugees from around the world were farming next to each other. And some of those refugees had come from countries that were from areas that, where they had been at war with a person growing food next to them. Mm. So I did a project for two to three years getting to know the dynamics of a community by photographing a community garden. When I graduated college, I had no place to show that work because I wasn't actually part of any one department. Mm -hmm. And so I walked into City Hall and I asked the mayor's secretary if I could have a show at City Hall of community garden photographs. This is in Provincetown? In Providence, Rhode, Providence, Providence. Rhode Island, capital city of Rhode Island. Providence. And he said yes. And I said, and with the help of one of his advisors, I said, would you be the honorary chair of my thesis show? And he said, I don't know what that means, but yes. And so then I called the senator's offices the next day and said, the mayor of Providence is the honorary chair of my thesis show. Would you be the honorary chairs also? And then when they said yes, I called every other politician I could think of or look up. Mm -hmm. And by the time I had my college thesis show, I had dozens of local people from arts organizations to city offices to state offices backing a show of photographs about refugees gardening on empty lots. And we had a big party, we got a grant. And that became the start of my career because some of the people who came to that show were art collectors um, or foundation representatives or government offices that then hired me to help with different campaigns. And it really transformed my life. So I really have Brown University to thank because there wasn't a place at Brown for me to have my thesis show. Interesting. And City Hall said yes. Interesting. So then you went to Yale to graduate mm -hmm. school. A few years later. So what did you yeah. do in between or, you know? For the first year out of school, I did every job I could find. I started out with, I didn't have an income. Um, and then some of those art collectors started supporting the work by buying additioned prints of the photographs. So then what I started to form was an idea of photography being a multi-use art form. What do you I mean could, by that? Well, I could make a publication, a book or a magazine article, mm -hmm. and that was a way of communicating something to the world. And the art shows were a craft. I, I care about the quality and beauty of a print. And by having those prints up in, in exhibitions mm -hmm. and selling them, I could make an income. And then by having press cover the book or the art shows, it spreads a message further and also advertises for the art shows right. and the book. Right. And then I realized that I could also give copies of my photographs to organizations, whether they were political or community organizations. And that those organizations in using the photographs could help to further a cause I believe in. And so that felt like activism. And the art shows feel like craft and art. And it's, it's a meaningful way of, for me of communicating what I do. And it, it, the sale of those prints also pays for this whole process. And the book is the complete idea. And the press is a way of communicating that idea to larger amounts of people. So, you're, so your first project was about gardens and food and refugees. And the, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. assuming kind of finding their their way into feeding themselves. Um, I'm, I'm, you, if you want to say more about that, what, yeah. what, what your well, message actually, you, you wanted to get across. That was about community through agriculture. I see. But it felt very local. Mm -hmm. I've never really shown those photographs outside of Rhode Island, which is the smallest state in the union. Mm. And I was thinking about how do I take an idea that I care about, but fit it into a larger narrative. And at the time, it was 2006, and I felt like the country was looking at big business. And this is also 2006, seven, and eight, those three years were the start of the recession. Right. And people were looking even more towards 
news of bailouts, government bailouts mm -hmm. and stock market. Everything seemed large. And I said, well, I wanted to learn about people's response in the most local way. Right. And whereas in growing up, my parents had grown most of our food and bartered for everything from shoes to dentistry. And we chose not to have TV at a moment when it wasn't normal not to have TV. Mm -hmm. And, but we still had cars, computers, were on the electric grid. So I said, I wanted to find out, find people who are responding to a moment in the world by trying to be self-sufficient. So I saved up money from the work I was doing in Rhode Island and put a bed in the back of a minivan and started driving around the mountains of North Carolina visiting friends of friends who had chosen to leave cities and suburbs to live off the grid in the rural southeastern United States. And over the five years of visiting those areas, I photographed in Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Georgia, and started a project that I eventually called a natural order. And it was those photographs that I used to apply to Yale for graduate school. And after graduate school, those photographs became my first book that led to a series of exhibitions and magazine articles that have let me spread a story around the world. And those photographs really tell of another way of life that many people don't know. I, I know this, I'm teaching a class right now on mm -hmm. utopias and dystopias. Mm -hmm. And I find with my students, they're not aware. You know, I had the good fortune to be mm -hmm. in a place called Silo Community, which I know is one of the communities that you visited mm -hmm. um, and you photographed. Um, but your photographs really kind of open up a window into a mm -hmm. very private world in a sense. I mean, they're very private photographs, I, I, I find. It varies, right? So some of the communities I photographed Think of what they do as lifestyle activism. Mm. I met a woman named Natalie Bogwalker, who is living at the Wild Roots Homestead in North Carolina. Is that her real name? It is her real name, she would say. Okay, okay. Um, that homestead was focused around learning earth skills. So people were, when I met them, living in bark houses um, made from local poplar trees and hunting and gathering their food also collecting roadkill, also dumpster diving, but they were punk anarcho-primitivists reacting to society by trying to live independently, but making a, a fairly public presence. You know, they were mm -hmm. on, they had a website, I wonder they if were the, you, findable. You know, you know the film, The East? I, I wonder if she took, they took in that script some of the ideas from that. It's a, mm -hmm. there they eat roadkill and they, they dumpster dive. Oh, yeah. it's a move, it was a movement. It's a movement. Um, but she, when I first started photographing there, Natalie called and asked if, if they could use some of my photographs for a gathering they were going to start mm. in Asheville, North Carolina. Oh. And I said, sure, and emailed her the pictures. And when I drove south for the next visit, I would, mm -hmm. I would work for a few months to save money at mm -hmm. first and then travel for a few months and photograph. Uh, and when I was driving south, I picked up local papers, which I always do, and I saw my photographs on the cover of all these papers advertising this gathering called the Firefly Gathering in Asheville, North Carolina. And what was interesting first was that this was news. The idea of people in the context of the, of the beginning of the recession trying to live independently was on the cover of a local paper. Extraordinary. And two, all of the photographs were credited to the people in them. So the photograph of Natalie was photo by Natalie, and the photograph of Doug was photo by Doug, Interesting. which I loved, because yes. it was a sign that the community was owning the photographs I was making of them. That's excellent. So we don't have a lot of time left, and I don't okay. want to miss talking about your most recent book um, and your, your exhibitions. And yeah, just sure. so, so, so tell us about this book. Um, it's just, yeah. it, I, I have to tell you that I, I, I was at this exhibit, and mm -hmm. it's one of the most brilliant, wonderful, beautiful, just kind of so moved me. Um, and so I, I would love for you to tell me about this and how you got here. You went out west, and, so, and there's an interesting yeah. narrative here. So, so tell us. So when I was close to finishing the photographs in the southeastern United States for my first book, A Natural Order, yes. my best friend, or one of my best friends, got a job at the Wyoming Public Radio Station and moved there. 
and I went to visit her. And when I got there, it was the, the biggest, wildest, harshest landscape I'd ever seen. Hmm. And I realized that I had talked about people in nature for years, but had never been in a place where nature was bigger than people or it felt bigger than people mm. in the everyday experience of being there. And so I started a project photographing in Wyoming and in the small towns next to wild land that the area of the American West is famous for. It's famous for being wild, the Wild West. Right. There were really two kinds of jobs that people could do, that most people could do. One was in agriculture or ranching, crossing over a little bit into tourism and working for the park systems um, or government land. And the other was mining. And along with the recession, along with the new technology um, that has come about in the past few decades, um, things like fracking have come about. But not just fracking has become popular, popularized in, in terms of what we protest against or what people are for because it opens up areas for industry. But in every area of mining, I saw technology coming in that allowed land that was previously not valuable becoming invaluable. And it's now, for example, profitable to mine a tenth of an ounce of gold from 2,000 pounds of rock. The rock is crushed and mixed with cyanide, and the gold is leached out and sold on the market. So the result of that are two mile wide holes that are transforming a landscape that used to be mountains. Mm. And so the book that resulted from the, ex from the years of photographing there starts with images for which the American West is famous, right? Ranching, men on horseback, women on horseback, um, people moving cattle, people mm. in, in people living in and interacting with wild land. Oh, the Hollywood versions, right. And then the photographs are a little bit strange always. So like right. they reference what's famous, right. the area's famous for, with a little strangeness in it. And then it ends with, the book ends with images of mining and mining towns. So we have to end, but okay. I know you have, you're working on another project. What's, what's your next one? And then we're gonna have to say goodbye, unfortunately, and we'll have to have you come back. I'm continuing to photograph stories of people in nature. Okay. Okay, so I highly recommend to our viewers that you go seek out Lucas Folia's work. Uh, you have a website. Do you want to give us, is it is Lucasfolia.com? It's Lucasfolia.com. Yeah, Lucasfolia.com. Uh, this video will be uh, on my website, HeidiHetner.com, and also on YouTube. And I really highly recommend if you can fo follow Lucas and when his shows come to your city, go. Because seeing them, you know, when you look at the photographs here in a book, it's, they're, they're, they're magnificent. But seeing them, you know, uh, full on, uh, it's just spectacular. I mean, you see a landscape like that. How, what size are, are, your, are your pictures when, you, when, you, when they're hung? The edition size is 36 by 46 inches. So that's significant. Yeah. And it really captures that sense of mm -hmm. vastness of the landscape. So thank you so much. I'm sorry we have to cut you off. I thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. This is Heidi Hutner with Coffee with H Times 2.